I'll start. Thank you for coming. My name is Bart Rask. I used to go to church here. Have good memories. Nice old faces sing. I'm going to talk about the science versus creation of science versus creationism. This is going to be a talk that none of you have ever heard, or many of you have probably never heard before. There'll be some facts, scientific facts from the scientific literature that you've never heard before. I'm just pulling together science from different uh, fields and putting them together to show you why the theory of evolution and its related fields is, in fact, a pseudoscience. All of you will learn something from this. There is probably 50% at least of what I'm going to tell you uh, none of you have probably ever heard before. All of it, I have my references documented. So if you don't believe what I say, all you have to do is look up my references to confirm. So I wanted to introduce you. Oh. So uh, I so see. This is, this is Ron Kincaid. You're a, self <laughs> you're a self starter, I see. Yes. All right, I like that. Uh, so Bart is an uh, orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I know personally, he repaired my shoulder and my meniscus, is Your that knee, what we yeah, call it? Meniscus. My yeah. knee, and uh, so all in the last couple, two, three years, so. Uh, but he's very good at this subject. Uh, his book, Evolution by... Affirming the Consequent. Consequent, I have no idea what that means, but uh, it's very good. You can get it anywhere from $20 to $65. You choose your price. But anyway, go to Amazon, you get your best deal, I guess. And uh, he's going to come out with a new book. Uh, anyway, uh, we have a lot of questions for you. The youth put together a lot of questions. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes having to answer them, but uh, uh, we'll get those soon as you, when you're done. Okay? Okay, great. All right, thanks. thanks. Uh, so the background is... Uh, uh, this book that I wrote, and plus some new information, all of my references are scientific. And then with any field, if, if you uh, dispute something, there are always going to be weaknesses in your argument. And I'm fortunately, I knew that there would be. So what I did is after I wrote a manuscript for the book, I submitted it to two evolutionary biologists who disagreed with everything that I said, one at Oregon State, one at UCAL Berkeley. And they wrote their arguments and sent references to support their arguments against me, and then I read their arguments and references and made sure I had a strong counter-argument. So everything I'm saying, probably every question you've had, I've heard before, and I should have an answer for it, because I was challenged by two very experienced biologists. Um, now, for the youth. But pastor, why should I believe the Bible? which says the earth is less than 10,000 years old and God created man, when my science teacher says the earth is four and a half billion years old and man created the lesser animals? The answer is the alleged science you were taught is wrong. Well, how could it all be wrong? To rationalize the long-term claims, basic scientific principles were violated. That's the answer. Evolution has a definition from the uh, National Science Foundation. Evolution is descent with modification from a common ancestor. I wrote it there because we're going to come back to that frequently. Evolution has a definition. And the mechanism is random mutation of DNA and then natural uh, selection of the mutants. Now, what does uh, descent with modification mean? That means an ancient creature long ago had descendants or offspring which gradually grew mo more body parts and then became reproductively isolated. That's what that means. There's two types of evolution, microevolution, which there is evidence for, in which uh, a common ancestor can undergo small changes, like different dog breeds or even a horse and a mule, or macroevolution, which there is no evidence for, which I've looked, I couldn't find it, and in which a, a common ancestor becomes a very different species. So the big question is, what's the difference between a little bit different and very different? And there is an answer. There's a very clear line. Very different species have uh, increased complexity and absolute reproductive isolation. And I'm going to define those terms. Increased complexity in macroevolution for which there is no evidence means you're adding more body parts, such as organs, organ components, or enzymes, which are different, integrate with other host uh, parts, and enhance or maintain uh, a function. 
And an example would be if a creature had an eye without a cornea, if it gradually had a descendant which did have a cornea. Evolution claims that can happen, but there's no evidence that it can. There's no evidence that you can add more body parts. Microevolution, you have the same number of parts, the parts are just modified a little bit, such as uh, changes in size, color, color, shape, or you just have duplicates of the same thing. That is the difference between what the evidence shows that can happen and what shows that it cannot happen. Microevolution, such as in skin color, you have a receptor for a hormone involved in skin color. That receptor has a, uh, a mutant form in which you can get red hair and, and whiter skin, and in, in, uh, as opposed to the non-mutant form, which darker hair or darker skin. And the only difference between it is the, a change in the receptor. No new parts, just a change of the existing part. Microevolution, plenty of evidence. Another example, ironically, uh, when Darwin went to the Galapagos, Galapagos Islands off South America, he came to his theory by looking at different finch beak sizes. On one Galapagos island, they had a broad beak, another a narrow beak, and he thought that there would be, could be a common ancestor, and I agree. But that's an example of microevolution. Same number of parts, the only difference is different beak size. Microevolution. Macroevolution. No evidence, but it's asserted by evolutionists. And a microscopic scale, uh, the flagellum, the tail of a cell, in a, uh, uh, some cells that have thinner cell walls, the attachment of the flagellum to the cell wall has relatively few protein parts. There's these little parts here. Here's the cell wall, uh, Staph aureus, for example, which causes back, uh, bad infections. There's all these little proteins for which the flagellum attaches to the cell. In other types of bacteria, which have a thicker cell wall, there's additional little proteins, such as an L-ring or a P-ring. Even though these bacteria can multiply every 20 minutes, no one have ever, has ever seen the bacteria evolve even these little microscopic parts. Those are more parts which are integrated with existing host parts, which are different. That is macroevolution. There's no evidence for it, not even in bacteria which, which can reproduce every 20 minutes. On a larger scale, it is believed by evolutionists that the swim bladder of a fish, not the gills, is the ancestor of the lung. Swim bladder is a simple sac. Lungs have a VLI and bronchioles. Evolutionists claim that over many generations, this simple swim bladder can grow alveoli and bronchioles. But there's no evidence that these new parts can ever be, uh, uh, can be derived by descent with modification. The other claim by evolutionists is that you can get isolated, um, you can get uh, reproductively isolated populations. So it's believed that some ancestral species, in which male and female can reproduce with each other, can evolve into two separate species, which cannot reproduce with each other. Man and chimp, we know, cannot mate with each other. It is hypothesized that an ancestral primate evolved into two separate populations, which cannot reproduce with each other but there's no evidence that this phenomenon has ever occurred. Now, there's millions of species that cannot reproduce with each other. Evolutionists claim that the phenomenon of one species evolving into multiple populations which cannot reproduce with each other has happened a million times over, but this phenomenon of being able to reproduce in this fashion has never been observed. I'm coming to a point here. That's, Dr., uh, that's uh, Pastor Kincaid's favorite president, by the way. All right, there's two types of reproductive isolation. This is key. This counteracts an argument by the evolutionists. There is non-absolute reproductive isolation in which two species do not normally reproduce, but they could, such as horses and donkeys don't normally reproduce, lions and tigers don't, but they could reproduce. There is conceivably, they could have a common ancestor. Absolute reproductive isolation is two species cannot reproduce no matter what. Evolution has no explanation for this phenomenon. Frauds and snakes, man and chimp, no matter what you do, they cannot reproduce, yet evolution says this reproductive isolation was derived a million times over through descent with modification. No evidence for this. There's no evidence that species that are unable to reproduce, not unwilling, but unable 
can be derived from a common ancestor, yet evolutionists claim it can. Now, the evidence for this phenomenon of absolute reproductive isolation is ubiquitous. Oh, believe it or not, a Soviet biologist in 1927 artificially inseminated human sperm and many female chimp and nothing happened. So we know man and chimp cannot mate even if you bypass the yuck factor. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Then in uh, a study at Cornell University, an investigator tried in vitro fertilization of human sperm with several species, chimps, monkeys, and about 10 others, and there was no reproductive isolation, there was no reproduction or even fusion of sperm and egg possible. And then, of course, uh, fish, most fish do external fertilization. In fact, uh, steelhead and a lamprey both deposit their sperm and egg at the Columbia River at the same time, the same place. Their sperms and eggs intermix, yet there's no cross-fertilization. So this phenomenon of absolute reproductive isolation is ubiquitous, yet evolution has never documented that it can occur by descent with modification. Now, one reason, I'm getting into the weeds now, I apologize, sperm and egg have receptors on them. A little receptor of a sperm from a human will only fit a receptor of a human egg. These receptors are species-specific. The little human sperm receptor won't fit a receptor of a gerbil, for example. That is one way that uh, there is a you can't get cross-species uh, cross fertilization. Now, there's a big conceptual pro problem for evolutionists. They claim that one species can evolve into two separate species, like a primate and man and chimp. Those species would have to have matching receptors on both ends, but they can't match each other. The conceptual problem is you have a common ancestor its sperm mutates, there's no egg for, it, egg for it to match with. It becomes extinct. The egg mutates, there's no sperm for it to mate with, and so it becomes extinct. So conceptually, if you have a deviation, really the restrictions imposed by the opposite sex, which is like marriage, as you all know, prevent evolution into separate populations. Any deviation from the original would prevent propagation of that new mutant, because you have to have sperm uh, egg receptor matching. And there's nearly an infinite number of combinations and shapes and, and electrical charges these little receptors can be. So since there's nearly an infinite number of receptor shapes and charges, it would be nearly impossible for the, you to get a, a new matching pair. Plus there's time and geography restrictions. So if for some reason a sperm mutated and for some reason egg mutated with the same way, it would have to do it within the same reproductive time and reproductive period. It wouldn't do any good if the, the female mutated 100 years or 100 miles away from the male. So there's a lot of restrictions which make it statistically impossible to evolve into two separate non-reproductive -pop, non populations. Now, evolution claims common ancestry among reproductively isolated populations. This claim ignores empirical evidence. Uh, Empirical evidence tells us and shows us that uh, 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 mating ability is required by populations that have uh, a common ancestor. We know from empirical evidence that only members of a population that can reproduce have a common ancestor. There is no evidence to the contrary. All right, now, fair question. I've just told you there's no evidence for this, there's no evidence for that, but there's all this scientific literature out there so if there's no evidence for evolution, what does the scientific literature actually show? Well, after re I read through 400 papers. It took me a long time. And after reading, maybe after through 50 or 100, I was able to classify them into two categories of what the papers actually show. And it actually got to be very comical. I would say about uh, the, the scientists' conclusions universally did not match the data. Uh, the first type of paper is, uh, papers are those that describe microevolution, such as small changes, changes of existing uh, compounds or existing parts. And the second, uh, just simply describe the diversity in nature with the macroevolution simply asserted. For example, um, uh, well, I'll get to the examples. Example one, I have 
lots of examples, but I picked out three. Uh, it was claimed in this paper in the Journal of Nature Communications that a multicellular creature could evolve from a unicellular creature. But all that happened when you read is that the, uh, the unicellular creature just grew a thicker cell wall and was able to clump to each other. So there was nothing new, same cell wall, just more of it. So there's no new different parts. It doesn't meet my definition of macroevolution. The cells were all the same, just a monotonous, clumped together cells, microevolution. Second example, it was claimed that uh, you could evolve reproductive isolation. Now, I just told you that there's no evidence for it, but there's this paper that says there is evidence for it. But when you read the details of the paper, the author admits that the, it was done in Drosophila of fruit flies, which takes only two weeks to reproduce. He, he uh, um, grew Drosophila, divided them into two different populations over several months, so they were, each separate population was able to um, evolve its own separate way. And it turned out that they would no longer reproduce with each other, but the author admits it was only a behavioral avoidance. It was not an absolute. So the author admits that they probably could have reproduced, but they chose not to. So it was not absolute reproductive isolation. It was not absolute reproductive isolation. Now, uh, there's a paper out there that says flagellum can evolve more parts. I just told you that there was no evidence for it. And uh, when you read the paper that says that flagellum can evolve more parts, all the author did was he described the different numbers of protein parts in different creatures. And most of the studies were done in bacteria. He said this bacteria has 20 parts, this bacteria has 25, but he didn't show any evolution. He simply described the diversity in nature and asserted that the evolution can occur. This is the most common fallacy that evolution authors uh, make. They des simply describe the diversity in nature and simply assert that it was caused by evolution. No, evolution for, no evidence for evolution. Remember, evolution, descent with modification from a common ancestor. When uh, uh, scientists uh, claim evolution, they forget the definition. Is a theory of evolution a scientific theory? The answer is no. What is science? These are my references. Standard, secular, science, and theology, or science and logic textbooks by most likely atheists. One of them is a guy who wrote a foreword in my book who doesn't believe in anything I say. <laughs> All right, now there's different types of truths. Um, there's historical truths, such as the Bible. And in the Civil War, for example, you can't do an experiment to show the Civil War occur. You'd have to get in a time machine and go back to 1861. All there are is human documentation. There's human documentation of the Bible. And, uh, but that, those are truths, but you cannot do an experiment to show the Civil War occurred. All you have is human doc. There are artifacts of the Civil War, but though is that isn't empirical evidence. Again, empirical evidence is something that you can reproduce. What is science? Science has a definition. You just can't call anything science. These are the commonly accepted, this is the commonly accepted definition of science by more than 90%, even the evolutionists that I consulted with agree with these definitions. It has to be testable. A test of the theory predicts its phenomena. Falsifiable, which is related to testable, and there has to be empirical evidence. Anything that can be observed or measured is amenable to scientific invest investigation. Explanations that cannot be based on empirical evidence are not part of science from the National Academy of Sciences website. I agree and most people agree with this definition of science. An example of testability, and I have an undergraduate degree in microbiology. If you have a theory that HIV causes AIDS, you inoculate HIV versus saline to an animal, and you see the, HIV, the AIDS, the empirical evidence, caused in the one injected with HIV only. That's empirical evidence. That's a testable theory, as opposed to reincarnation. You can't test it. Frogs can't talk. All right. Evolution is not science. No empirical evidence. It cannot be tested or falsified because it allegedly takes billions of years. Evolution arguments claiming it's science are distorted 
because the dissent with modification is ignored. A uh, fellow who helped me with my book, who disagrees with everything, he says you can test the theory by looking for outcomes that it predicts. This is a very common argument of evolutionists. Evolution predicts the fossil record and transitional species. The problem is the dissent with modification is not demonstrated to produce this outcome. Evolution is not truly tested. Evolution is dissent with modification from a common ancestor. That's not my definition. National Science Foundation definition. A true test would be you follow the descendants of the fossil record modifying into transitional species. But of course you can't test this because this allegedly would take billions of years. All right, here's something illustri illustrative. Here's how you test a real science versus the pseudoscience of evolution. In real science, you have a, private, a prior state, such as 10 live rats, you feed five cyanide pills, five a placebo. You have an outcome of five dead rats. <laughs> Prior state, intervention, outcome. All empirical evidence, you can see and measure all three. Evolution is allegedly you have an ancient primate, as, as indicated by the fossil record. It allegedly undergoes descent with modification and you get the outcome, man and chimp. The difference is clear. With real science, you can see or measure the prior state. You see or measure the intervention giving the pill. You see or measure the outcome. Evolution, by contrast, you see the fossil record ancient primate. You see the outcome, but the descent with modification is nowhere to be found. Claiming evolution is testable in the same way that real science is testable is like claiming you're testing a pill but no one sees the pill being given. That's the absurdity of it. Another argument. Evolution predicts many outcomes, therefore it must be true. The number of positive outcomes is not enough to support your theory. You must show at least a cause and effect, excuse me, a cause and effect or at least a strong association. And uh, here's some examples. The geocentric theory of the universe where the, it was believed that the sun revolved around the earth Ancient Greeks devised mathematical formulas where you can act accurately predict the position of the sun around the earth based on this false theory. There's also the theory of preformation, or of the, excuse me, of the spontaneous generation in which uh, maggots would grow on meat after you left it out a while and you leave out several pieces of meat. All of them would grow maggots. That is a lot of data that supports your theory of spontaneous generation. So the theory, that the belief that you can have a lot of outcomes that support your theory is supportive of your theory is not true. You must show the intervention at least contributing to your theory. Uh, there's a tool in science called inductive inference. It's a legitimate tool. It's a way of getting an educated guess. Atheist Richard Dawkins in his book he makes a big point of using inference. He says, I'll show the irrefragable power of inference that evolution is fact. And inference is reasoning from a specific examples to a general principle, such as you see the fossil record, you see DNA, and from that you can make the educated guess that they were derived by evolution. But evolutionists, they falsely use inductive inference to compensate for the inability to document changes over billions of years. Inference requires examples. Uh, this is a classic example you'll see in logic textbooks. You, to infer something, you need examples. If you see two white swans, you can infer all that are white. But if you have 400 white swans, your inference that all swans are white is even greater supported. If you don't see any white swans, there's a, then there's no basis for you to believe that swans are white. You have to have examples to infer things. Trends can sometimes be observed. You can see a trend of the weight of water with its volume, and, uh, but some trends you know the plateau at the top, so trends can sometimes be inferred, sometimes you can't. Also, the more analogous the example, the stronger the inference. In orthopedic surgery, sometimes you get infections, and the most common organism that causes infection in orthopedics is Staph aureus. How do we know? I, now, so if uh, Ron, for example, if he had a knee infection after my surgery, 
I would automatically give him an anti-staph drug. And I wouldn't do any tests, because I wouldn't have to do any tests, because other doctors prior to me that published journal articles said that over 80% of the time, infections after knee surgery is due to staph. How do I know that? Because of prior examples that are analogous. Now, I wouldn't treat him for another infection like gonorrhea or anything, because it's... <laughs> no offense. Because, because it's not an sexually transmitted diseases have different infections. So that's not an analogous example. So the example has to be analogous. I know it would be staph because it's after orthopedic surgery and not from something else. So I wouldn't give him an anti-gonorrhea drug. You have to have analogous examples to make an educated guess or do inductive inference. Another common uh, argument. What else could it be? It's the simplest explanation. Now, I'm sure you've all heard this before. But there's no reason for evolution to be considered the, the only or simplest explanation because there's no examples. Remember, to infer something, there has to be analogous examples. Another an analogy of this is if you see a dead raccoon squashed on the street, you can infer a car ran over it. Why? Because when you were four years old, you learned that your big foot can smash a small little spider. Big things can smash little things. You also know from experience that cars go over, go over the street and that little things like raccoons can go over the street. So you know from your own experience that there, even though you didn't see the raccoon squashed by the car, you know that's the most likely answer because of prior experience. But with evolution, there is no human experience of it. So one cannot infer that it's the simplest or most obvious answer because there's no examples. The other argument is, uh, since we know that microevolution occurs with time, you can infer macroevolution. You just extend the, the timeline over a billion years. Well, the problem is, these are not analogous examples. Microevolution has the same complexity and no reproductive isolation. Macroevolution, there is an increase in, in complexity, and there is no, and there, uh, excuse me, and there is reproductive isolation. Microevolution, or correction, macroevolution is not a small increase in parts. It is no increase in parts. They are qualitatively different. One has more parts, one only modifies the existing parts. One is not an extension of the other. They are qualitatively different. It'd be like leaving bread out for a while. It gets moldy and hard, but if you leave it out even longer, it's not going to turn into a ham sandwich. Ham sandwiches have more parts to it. <laughs> that would be a very analogous example. What would be a real example of evolution? A real example, so you can't infer evolution because of, there's no examples. A real example would be if you deserve, observe descendants of a common ancestor grow more parts and become absolute reproductive isolation. Well, when I gave this uh, argument to one of my uh, colleagues, he says, well, that's not a fair test because that would take billions of years. Well, the counter argument, well, there is, therefore it's not testable and not a science. Remember, science has to be testable. That's not my definition. That's National Academy of Sciences and everybody else. If it's not testable, it's not science. This criteria makes it so evolution is not a real science. I'm just the dot connector. I'm just pointing you together these facts. All right, here's something interesting I came across. The alleged similarity between the DNA of man and chimp. Unrelated humans have a DNA similarity of over 99%. It's reported that man and chimp's DNA similarity is over 98%. The implication is that since man and chimp DNA is so similar, that it wouldn't take much of a mutation to evolve the two populations. So I looked in the reference on how they did the article, how they did the paper. And when you read the fine print, you'll find a big, huge error in the logic. Um, DNA has 3.2 billion base pairs at different segments of it. And when they did the experiment, they chopped them up randomly into three to 600 base pair segments, and they matched up the segments in a random fashion. They didn't match, now, DNA, the arrangement is everything in terms of what it'll code for. So what that paper said is essentially that uh, 
It's like saying if you have two books with 98% of the syllables or words that are similar. Well, of course, arrangement is everything. All it shows was different segments of it were the same, but it didn't make any um, reference to the arrangement. So it was chopped up, random DNA, that's 98%, but the didn't have anything to do with the organization of the genes. Not 98% of the genes, 98% of randomly chopped up segments without any regard to its organization. So I found other papers, contradictory. Five minutes, okay. Journal of Nature, 80% of the genes between man and chimp were the same. That's a lot less than 98%. Journal of Gene, not Genesis, Journal of Gene, only half of the chimp proteins have a human counterpart. And the, the proteins are made by the DNA. Y chromosome was thought to be 1.9% difference by this fragmentation method, but when you actually take into consideration the organization of the right Y chromosome, in the Journal of Nature letters, there was an over 30% difference. So the conclusion that there's a 98% similarity is obviously wrong. It's, it's uh, disregarded by both the methodology and by these other references. Uh, and uh, so this goes against the uh, concept of common ancestry. There's, there can't be common ancestry between unrelated, between species that can't, uh, uh, the species that can't mate. All fertile offspring of every common, excuse me, all fertile offspring of every common ancestor we know can mate. Man and chip can't mate, but we know that if there's a common ancestor, every single generation that's fertile can mate in between. This contradicts uh, evolution. Uh, and uh, I'll skip that, we'll go on. Um, let me get on to archaeologic dating. Archaeologic dating is based on unsupported assumptions, biased confirmation studies, and erroneous half-life calculations. It's believed that uh, atmospheric carbon-14 is incorporated in living things, and after the living thing dies, carbon-14 degrades, and then you can estimate the age by how much carbon-14 there is based on how much there is in the atmosphere. So you have 100%, which is what's in the atmosphere. If you find something uh, several years later, and it has half of what's in the atmosphere, it's believed to be 5,730 years. Half-life of carbon-14 is believed to be 5,700 years. Uranium, uh, believed to have a half-life of 4.5 billion years. It degrades to uh, lead, and you estimate it by um, finding the ratio of lead to uranium, and if there's a mixture of a rock that's half lead and half uranium, then it's probably 4.5 billion years old. But how do you know what you started with? and how fast it disappears. It assumes all lead in the sample was from uranium decay. Well, why can't uranium or lead be de novo, meaning from the beginning, like lead, like uh, uranium? Why is all the lead only from uranium decay? Couldn't the lead be, some lead be there from the beginning? This is an assumption. Uh, it also assumes that all life started with the same amount of atmospheric carbon-14. Subsequent papers show that another source of carbon-14 is from bacteria, fungi, and from radio, uh, radium decay. Also assumes that the decay pattern is all the same, is all the same logarithmic, it's log, natural log base two, is all the same logarithmic pattern. In other words, it patterns, follows a pattern more like this purple line and not like these other lines. Well, how do you know that's true? It also assumes you can accurately measure a half-life of, of billions and thousands of years. How do you know the half-lives are accurate? Well, despite, I'll just finish this, Ron, and we'll go, this is, there's a lot of questions related to dating. Well, despite this, I found two papers where they compared uh, carbon dating with actual measurements from tree rings and uh, Egyptian records. And the left is from a 1949 paper, the right is from a 2010 paper. 1949 paper, everything seems to line up pretty well. 2010 paper, there's a lot of scatter. Also, when you read these papers, there was no blinding. Now, when you blind, it means that the author, the, the, the author measuring the carbon-14 
knew what the answer was. So there's a potential for bias in your reporting of what the actual radioactive uh, reading was. So there's no mention if they were blinded. And the curious thing is the newer sample, the newer study, showed a lot more scatter than the older sample, which makes me believe that there might be some bias in the study. Also, the study only went back to about 4,200 years ago. But evolutionists claim that uh, uh, carbon dating can be, go back to 50,000 or even a million years. Now, this, it goes against natural, this goes against the standard scientific principles. In science, you have to uh, calibrate and document the accuracy of your instruments. It's like saying you, you know your bathroom scale is accurate to 300 pounds, but it's not accurate to 3,000 pounds. This is what evolutionists do. They semi-document a measuring tool back to 4,200 years, and it's still sketchy. And they somehow extrapolate that, that you can go on, that can be a factor of 10 to the power of 2 or even 3, longer than that. It's, it's, when you think about it, it's pretty absurd. Nowhere else in science can you get away with this type of extrapolation. You probably can a little bit with a, with a straight linear curve, but obviously this isn't a linear curve. They extrapolate from this obviously scattered data 10 times, 20 times more. Nowhere else in science can you get away with that. Uranium was uh, also uh, measured against glass artifacts, and you could see, well, samples at 1500 BC had the same activity as 1964 AD. So there's really no relationship. Now, I presented this to my uh, cohort, and he said, well, uranium's not used for that low, low of dates. It's mainly for between 1 million and 5 billion years. Well, it's pretty convenient when you make up a test that no one has any way of confirming. That's the definition of a pseudoscience. Now, I have, this is important. The half-life formula. How do we know it's correct? This is the formula. Natural log, it involves grams, the weight, the number of atoms. What they do in the carbon-14, the half-life of uh, carbon is, is alleged to be 5,730 years. They measured 1,280 uh, disintegrations per second per milliliter, over one millisecond period. In uranium, measured 62 counts per minute, over a five-minute period. One point. From the one point, they were able to make this whole entire curve. Where else in science can you take one point and generate an entire curve? That's, you, nowhere else in science can you get away with that. One point, you get in over a millisecond, and five minutes, you generate a curve over a billion years. Now, that's, anybody admits that has to be absurd. Well, their argument is, well, we know the pattern of decay. Actually, you don't. And I'll show you why you don't know the pattern. So it's believed it follows a... Uh, oh, the other thing, they use mass. Half-life is not dependent on the mass. And you think about it. The half-life of one gram of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. After that amount of time, you get a half a gram. What's the half-life of that? 5,730. So the half-life is independent of mass. But the formula they use uses mass. So the formula they use has to be wrong. Oh, how do you get those big numbers? So I, I went through the math, and those of you who had chemistry and physics, there's a number called Avogadro, Avogadro's number, which is a huge number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Since they use mass in calculating, they have to to factor out the mass. And to do that, they have to use Avogadro's number with the 10 to 23rd power. Well, that's how you get these huge numbers for these half-lives. The other thing is, how do you know the half-life, the decay is over this logarithmic pattern? Well, what I did is I looked up radioactive material with short half-lives that you can actually directly measure. And lo and behold, it's different. Protactinium used in the nuclear industry where you have to really have to know what the half-life is. The predicted starts up here, but the actual starts a lot lower. It's not the logarithmic base 2 formula that's advocated. Measured data conflicts with the hypothetical formula. Well, that's one. I have three other examples. All of these, iodine and so forth, 
25 minutes, 34 days, 86 days. These were all directly measured. Then the scientists reversed engineered the formula. All three formulas were different from the formula used in uranium and carbon, and none of them used, used the grams or number of uh, molecules. So we know the way they figured out, both by empirical and just by knowing that it's, they used grams when they shouldn't have, has to be wrong. All right, I just have one little G.K. Chesterton. When men choose not to believe in God, they do not thereafter believe in nothing. They can believe in anything. And my little corollary is everyone believes in the supernatural. It's just that those who don't believe in God as a creator don't realize it. And that's all. All right, did you keep up with that? <laughs> Told you he was smart. All right, so uh, we're going to open it up to questions, and we're going to start with Chris. So, Chris, come on up here. Our youth put together a, a list of questions, and so I'm going to let Chris ask, I don't know, six or eight, and then maybe we'll uh, go to some of you. Uh, how many have questions, by the way? Just raise your hand. I want to see what we've got. Otherwise, we'll just let Chris keep going. Not too many ready to... You're afraid of Bart. Is that it? And you're like, what do I ask the guy? All right, go ahead. You get, you get, roll it for a while, uh, Chris. Yeah, sure. And I'll, I'll just I kind of give a little bit more background on where the questions came from because part of the struggle of being a Christian in public schools these days is that evolution is assumed as the truth. And so a lot of these questions, excuse me, a lot of these questions I framed them. I said, what are the questions you have received as Christians in your public schools when they ha when someone's disagreed with you, or like a teacher, <clears throat> excuse me, a teacher or a friend? So that's where a lot of these, um, <clears throat> that's where a lot of these questions came from. So I'm going to have to look through these. Okay. So how does uh, Christianity explain common characteristics between humans and previous models of the homo genus? So homo sapien, you know, homo, or, and then some of the other ones. I, I can't remember all the names, all right. but, you know, Neanderthals, something like that. All right. Well, um, uh, those human, uh, uh, these, those alleged human ancestors are just different creatures. They're different animals. There's no evidence that they are pre-human. Uh, what they do is there's uh, a big thing that you look at is the skull sizes. And they line up the skull sizes and you see a gradual increase in skull size. Um, but no one has shown that, you, that a creature can evolve a bigger brain. We know the big difference between humans and chimps is a larger frontal lobe and then they have a, an area for speech called uh, Broda's area and Wernicke's encephalops, so Wernicke for understanding and Broca's area for speech. Chimps don't have that. Man alone has that. They have a larger frontal lobe. Now, what, what people forget is that skull size is a reflection of brain size. To assume that these creatures are ancestors of humans means that you believe that a creature with a small brain can evolve, can have descent with modification into a creature with a larger brain. But there's no evidence of that. No one has ever seen a creature with a smaller brain Give descent, give a, have a ancestor with a creature from a larger brain. Remember, now you can believe that, but there's no evidence for it. It is not a scientific belief. Remember, that's why I put this up here. Science is testable. There's no way you can test that. Our evolutionists argue, well, you can't show that because it takes a billion years. Well, then it's not testable and not a science. So you can believe that these subhuman creatures are ancestors, but it's not a scientific belief because no one can show that, it was, that those ancestors, uh, through descent with modification, became man. And there's no evidence that a creature can grow a bigger brain. I hope that answers that question. Okay, uh, so how do you explain how trees and plants were created before the sun, moon, and stars? All right, when you, one has to accept that there's a supernatural. When you accept that there's a supernatural, everything falls into place. If you accept that there's a God, a supernatural God that can do anything, then that supernatural God, if he can create everything, he certainly can create trees and plants before there's a sun. And uh, now it, 
Um, and, and, and he certainly, if he can create something out of nothing, he certainly can create trees and plants that can survive without a sun. So that is obviously supernatural, but that's what believe in God is. And remember, everybody believes in the supernatural. Some people just don't realize it. You just have to acknowledge and be honest with yourself that there is supernatural. Okay, so this one has, it's a two-parter. So if light takes a couple million years to travel to Earth from very dis distant stars, why can we see them if everything was created you know, only 6,000 years ago or so? Because we don't know those stars are six million light years away, that's why. The measurements used to measure those stars is notoriously contrived. What, what is, I, of course I anticipated these questions. I, um, there's a star is called Cepheid variables. They're flashing stars. And there's a, a measurement technique called parallax, where you look at something from two different sides and through triangulation, you close one eye, something looks over here, close the other eye, it looks over there, and through triangulation you can estimate how far that thing is away. Well, that's done, that's called parallax. And you, the parallax technique is accurate to 500 light years. To be on that, there's only one Cepheid variable within this, the parallax method where you can measure. Well, this flashing light, these flashing stars, it is hypothesized that the frequency of their flashing and the intensity that you can infer how far that is away. And when you look at the data, there's no basis for their inference. It's all based on speculation. And the, the belief that these stars are millions of light years away is based on totally inaccurate uh, methodology. Yes, Vern. Scripture does mention, I think, 15 or 16 times that God has stretched out the heavens. It doesn't say when that happened, and so it's not clear that uh, uh, we don't know where those were during different times. And so they may have been closer. The light that we see may have been a lot closer. It doesn't look the same. So uh, that has to be factored in as well. Yeah. But anyway, um, Cepheid variables are based on the assumption that stars in a cluster are the same distance away. And when you look at a bunch of stars in a cluster from the Earth, it disregards the th third dimension. If you see something in a cluster and looking away, for example, from where you're standing right there, it looks like my fingers are the same distance apart, and it still looks like they're the same distance apart, but they're not really. They assume that stars in cluster are the same distance apart, and that's one of the basis of the um, distance measurements, is they make false assumptions based on the disregarding of the third dimension. Yeah. So adding on to that question, how could the stars have been created um, after the Earth if the speed of light shows that many stars are much, much older? Well, again, that's, uh, it's the false measuring techniques. Now, remember, science has to be testable. Measuring techniques have to be verifiable. I skipped a slide, but uh, let me just go back to that because this, this is a recurring theme. When you measure things, they have to be measured against a gold standard, and they have to be calibrated. You devise a new scale. You put things of known weight on it to know what you're measuring is accurate. When MRIs first came out in the 1980s, we didn't know what the images meant, so we put known cadaver samples in the MRIs, and we found that these images correlated with this pathology seen in real life. That's how you calibrate. Now, in my medical journal, an article came out about two years ago. Someone came out with this blood uh, count testing device. After knee replacement surgery, a lot of blood is lost, and um, phlebotomist draws your blood every day to find out what your blood count is. You stick a needle in your arm. Well, someone came out with this method where you just clip this little light on your finger, and it measures your blood count that way without a needle. Well, how do you know it's accurate? Well, it's, we know it's accurate because the author of the study compared it and calibrated it to the gold standard method, sticking a needle in your arm. You have a measuring device. You need a gold standard or some method of calibrating. That's the flaw in these light year measurements. We have no way of knowing that what we're measuring is true because it's not been calibrated. That is the basic flaw in this pseudoscience. There's no way of calibrating and no way of confirming your measurements. Okay. Yes. 
Just what about the whole idea of the Big Bang Theory? Such as, I, I, is that a science? Is it not? It's not a science. testable at all because it's not testable. We hear a lot of the all Big right, Bang well, Theory um, explanations. Yeah, what the Big Bang is based on uh, Hubble and others who found that this, there's this redshift phenomenon where some stars have this red hue, which is believed to be a star moving away from you. Kind of analogous to when a siren goes by you on the highway, it, the uh, waves of the sound waves are different. And, uh, oh, there we go. But the problem is, when Hubble looked up in the sky, and there's an Italian uh, 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 astronomer as well, he found that the, not all of them were redshift, some of them blue shift, allegedly come toward you. Toward you. So five out of 20 were coming toward you, and the rest were going away from you, and the same ratio is also confirmed by this Italian astronomer. So if there's a Big Bang Theory, how can you have some coming toward you and some going away from you? The other thing is this expansion theory is not confirmable because over human history, the distance between the stars has been the same. So it's one of these things where we can make a claim, but there's no way for you to confirm it. Now, I asked a physicist, well, have, despite the, the theory that these stars are expanding away from each other, has anyone actually measured an increase in distance? He said, no, because it takes a long time and the, they're so far away, it would be immeasurable. Well, if you make a claim that can't be confirmed, that's not really a science. Um, another contradictory, Bernard's star. It's a star that was shown to change position, but in the horizontal direction. It showed its position change with respect to other ones, contradictory to the big thing. Through. So the only star that was shown to actually change position is one that wasn't moving away. It was changed position between 59 and 97. Uh, oh, and another astronomer, he was able to document several pictures of where a redshifted, allegedly star moving away from you, was actually uh, physically attached to by a star that had no shift to it. And his theory was that these redshift were actually just new stars being born, and the redshift was due to the electron um, energy drop. The, the electrons were drawing from, dropping from one energy uh, stage to another energy stage. It had nothing to do with the moving. Yes? Right, and that's, that's why the redshift is believed that it indicates a star going away, and blue shift means a star is coming toward. They and have they measured in a lab? Do we know no, for well, a certain Well, I had the same the question, and the only study I could find was where they had light reflect back and forth across mirrors, and they saw a red hue. But I'm not really sure if that indicates, because it's reflections back and forth, and when you do that, the, the wavelengths can merge with each other. And and so there's no real documentation that the redshift actually indicates light moving away from you. Okay. Have they, it's, it's, have they measured the gold standard of a standard wavelength of light in a lab? Have they measured that gold standard so that they can say the redshift is longer and that the blue uh, shift is I believe is they have, yes. They do know that the redshift is a longer wavelength, yes. Okay. But they've, they do actually know the actual wavelength of light because they've measured that I, in a I lab? I believe so, yeah, but I'm not 100% okay. sure, yeah. Anyway, the Big Bang is based on false assumptions and immeasurable uh, claims, which is what all these pseudosciences are. If you make a claim that says, well, you can't confirm it because it takes too long or it's too far away, you have to take that with a grain of salt. That's not a real science. Remember, explanations that cannot be based on empirical evidence are not part of science. Empirical evidence is testable, falsifiable. It was, empirical evidence is observable and measurable. National Academy of Sciences. It's not science if you can't measure it or see it. They make claims that are immeasurable and inconfirmable. You can believe it, but you can't call it a scientific belief. That's the theme of today's show. Anything else?
I, I'll do one more for you. So how do you explain Adam and Eve basically giving birth to an entire civiliz civilization without, um, you know, incest completely destroying their genetics? So basically, where did, you know, Adam and Eve's children get their spouses from, and how did that not just mess with the genetic code because well, that, of that incest? Actually, yeah, that actually has a scientific explanation. Uh, Adam and Eve allegedly were genetically pure. The reason incest is bad is because of... Uh, of um, uh, children can be carriers of genetic mutations. You can have, for example, some, one brother can be a carrier for cystic fibrosis, a sister can be a carrier, and you could be, uh, not have any symptoms. But since you both came from the same parents, you're more, both more likely to be carriers. And if you're a carrier for it, if you mate, then you're more likely to have someone who has the problem. So the reason Adam and Eve probably had, were able to have their children uh, mate with each other is because there was no time to accumulate these genetic mutations. The reason incest is bad is because of genetic mutations that are uh, silent. They're, you're you're more likely to be a carrier of a mutation. If you have no mutations, and Adam and Eve were perfect at the time, then that's why their incest of their children wasn't harmful. It's a very rational... Yes, sir. Whoa, you really speak up a lot. <laughs> You're a long walk, too. So this relates to carbon dating. I know that um, early scripture, for example, um, from, and we, we had talked about this a couple of weeks ago, the youth, that we know which scriptures are the earliest, and that's how we can say things like the, the scripture, of the, you know, the, the so-called gospels of the, the Gospels that aren't consistent with, with the others, we know that they're older. So this may be as much a question for Ron as for you, Dr. Dr. Durask. Do they use carbon dating to establish the age, uh, to estimate the age of the Gospels, which we say are earliest, and we say they arrive as early as 20 to 50 years by eyewitness? Is that claim by archaeologists based on carbon-14 dating? I, I believe, I think the Dead Sea Skulls were based on carbon dating. Like I said, there is, tends to be some accuracy of it up to about 4,200 years ago. And, uh, but you, again, you can't extrapolate beyond that, and its accuracy is a little fuzzy. So it's not an accurate, and you saw all the scatter on those diagrams I showed you. Uh, well, no, 4,200 years ago. Right, but I mean... To 2000, 2000 B.C. 2,000 years ago, it would be accurate. Which is yeah, it was somewhat are, accurate. Okay. Again, the, okay. these studies, are, are, there was, there weren't, they were biased and a lot of scatter. There's probably... And I think there's probably some independent confirmation by uh, other documents uh, from known kings at the time. That's more of a... Biblical question, but the archeolo But again, that's a, the, as far as the carbon fourteen. There may be some accuracy to about forty two hundred years ago. You got one more up your sleeve, Chris. This will I be mean, your last I, one. I can find one. I've <laughs> yes, sir. All right, we'll go to Ryan. Do you have a scientific theory of um, where the timetable is for dinosaurs and and what what is the timeline for that? Well, I don't know, but as, as far as I know, dinosaurs and man are probably exist at the same time from what I've read, but that's a little out of my field. Uh, all I can say is there's no evidence that our dating techniques that dinosaur bones are millions of years old are accurate. All I can say is when they say that the dinosaur bone is 500 million years old, that's bogus. There's no scientific evidence. That's all I can tell you. They could be 5,000 years old. We do know that throughout human history, species have come and gone, like the dodo bird. Why couldn't dinosaurs live at the same time of man and just become extinct like the dodo bird? I don't see any reason why not. Okay, so Bart, um, let's do one more summary. You know, a good, good term paper has a conclusion. Would you wrap this all up? What would be the uh, high points of what you've said tonight? What do you want us to take home? Uh, the take home is, is that the big thing is knowing the difference between the supportable evolution, macro, uh, microevolution, and macro. Macro is more parts, 
There's no evidence for it. And if the other take-home part, the supplement to that, if there's no evidence for it, it's not a science. Evidence, you have to have evidence in order for it to be called a science. When I had uh, first written my book, or the first draft of it, when I submitted it to my colleagues, they say, well, prove that this is wrong. Well, I can't prove that it's wrong. It's hard to prove a wrong. But the burden of proof is on the evolutionists. Since evolutionists claim it's a science, the burden of proof is on them to give supportive evidence. And that is what is lacking. The burden of proof is on them to give support that a creature can evolve more parts with descent from modification. The other th thing is I'd like you to, to challenge you on when you read about evolution and when someone says that there's evidence for this, evidence for that, look at the reference and look to see how the paper was done. And when you actually pick it apart, you'll see that the evidence isn't there. If, it, it's, if it, the evidence shows, for example, that uh, uh, a creature was able to evolve more, enzyme, uh, uh, more enzymes for its pathway, for example, in blood clotting, for example, you'll see that all they're doing is comparing the different number of enzymes among different creatures and they just assume that the evolution occurred. That's what I challenge you. Really read the paper to see do they really show descent with modification or they are just asserting it. That is what I'd like you to take home, especially as students. Read the original reference, see how it was done, and don't just read the abstract, the author's conclusion. Make, see if the author's conclusion really fits what the data show, and you'll see that uh, universally, it does not. I went through 400 papers, and I couldn't find one. Thank you, Bart. You're welcome.